Detective Comics, a brand established in the 1930s, is the publisher of the comic book world's most iconic superheroes. That it's often the first word that comes to mind alongside the iconic Marvel Comics. While its comic output is legendary, cinematically it leaves a lot to be desired. Numerous DC TV shows, video games, and especially films have been cancelled over the decades. Some were highly anticipated. Others were reviled before and after cancellation. The DC Cinematic Universe is recently looking like it may turn over a new leaf following the success of films like Aquaman and Shazam. With the October 4th release of the highly anticipated and now record-breaking Todd Phillips directed film Joker, it's time to review more past tales of corporate backstabbing and public failures. Previously we covered 5 DC films that struggled through the development and production process. However, there are always more stories worth telling. In this video, we will discuss 5 more failed DC adaptations the troubled developments behind them, and the stories these films could have told. Lobo, the character Stan Lee once said was his favorite DC character, was first introduced to the world in June 1983's release of Omega Man issue number 3. Originally written as a villainous bounty hunter, the character was not popular until the 1990s. Lobo was introduced as a hardened anti-hero biker and became very popular among DC readers. This led to various solo outings and comic storylines. Many felt Lobo was often written as a parody of Marvel's more edgier characters such as Wolverine or The Punisher. Though he appeared in various TV shows and in the NetherRealm Studios video game Injustice Gods Among Us, Lobo has never had a feature film. The closest DC Comics came to creating a film with him as the main character was the 2002 Lobo Paramilitary Christmas Special, a short feature made for the American Film Institute. The short starred Texas Chainsaw Massacre actor Andrew Brynjarski and cost only $2,400 to produce. In 2009, Snatch director Guy Ritchie decided to create a film version of Lobo. Production was scheduled to begin in early 2010, using a gruff tone in the vein of Ritchie's previous film Lock, Stock and Two Smoking Barrels, with a PG-13 rating. Variety reported the plot as, Lobo is a 7-foot-tall, blue-skinned, indestructible, and heavily muscled anti-hero who drives a pimped-out motorcycle and lands on Earth in search of four fugitives who are bent on wreaking havoc. Lobo teams with a teenage girl from a small town to stop the creatures. Production did not start as anticipated in early 2010. Instead, Richie left the film to work on Sherlock Holmes' A Game of Shadows, starring Robert Downey Jr. The Lobo project stagnated until Brad Payton, the director from Journey to the Mysterious Island, signed on to direct and write. A few months later, Peyton managed to bring frequent contributor Dwayne The Rock Johnson on board. Johnson didn't last long and in February of 2013 he dropped out in order to play Black Adam in other DC projects. In March of 2016, Wonder Woman writer Jason Fuchs was contracted to write the screenplay. Little else was reported and the film was cancelled in the wake of Batman vs Superman Dawn of Justice underperforming. In February of 2018, a Lobo film was reportedly being discussed with Transformers director Michael Bay. Talks were possibly inspired by the massive success of Tim Miller's Deadpool. However, not much information has surfaced since. It appears talks are still ongoing, and we can only speculate whether Lobo will make it to the big screen, or if it will die again. Plastic Man is one of the original comedic comic book characters. Decades before Deadpool became a sensation, Plastic Man was using quirky slapstick humor mostly involving his stretching body to catch criminals. Although he was not a major commercial success when he was first introduced in Police Comics Issue 1 circa August of 1941, he has grown a significant fan base. Every appearance, whether it be in comics, video games, or television crossovers, was always silly and humorous. Warner Brothers greenlit a Plastic Man movie in the early 1990s off the success of Tim Burton's Batman. Steven Spielberg's Amblin Entertainment was to produce the feature, with the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers director Brian Spider helming the project. The screenplay was written by the Wachowskis, four years before they struck gold with The Matrix. Ultimately, the movie was never produced. It was quietly dropped not long after the script was written. There were rumors about it resurfacing in 2003. At that time, the entire script was leaked. Progress on producing the film was not made until mid-2008. The Wachowskis' latest film, Speed Racer, crashed and burned at the box office, making only $93.9 million against a production cost of $120 million. Desperate to make something, they chose to update an old Plastic Man script. The script remained mostly the same, and was described as having a tone similar to the films Who Framed Roger Rabbit, The Mask, and Men in Black. The plot centered on an environmentally conscious ex-con named Daniel O'Brien. He was a silly man who rarely takes anything seriously, much to the chagrin of the woman he loves, Susan Bright. Both O'Brien and Bright 
work for a powerful industrialist named Icarus Argon who desires immortality because he is slowly dying. Argon wants Bright's research because he believes it is the key to becoming immortal. O'Brien breaks into Argon's animal testing facility and becomes a test subject for various chemicals. It turns him into Plastic Man which he discovers while attempting to urinate. He realizes his urine is no longer biodegradable. He panics and wants to kill himself. After Argon discovers O'Brien has been using chemicals from their animal testing project, he frames him as an eco-terrorist. This results in Plastic Man having to fight off the law and Argon's men in order to save the day. The film's climax was planned around Plastic Man fighting Argon, who has become another Plastic Man, while the toxic experiments threaten to turn Calumet City and Bright into sludge. A tentative release date was given as December 2009. Jim Carrey and Evil Dead star Bruce Campbell were considered for the leading role, but instead it went to Matrix star Keanu Reeves. After the announcement of the actor chosen to play the lead role, critics and the public were silenced. 2009 came and went, and the next film the Wachowskis made was not Plastic Man, but instead Cloud Atlas. In 2013, there were rumors that Doctor Who actor David Tennant was going to play Plastic Man in the Justice League movie. It was either a false rumor or plans had changed as The Flash ultimately became the comedic member of the 2017 Justice League movie. Now more than 25 years after first receiving a green light, there continues to be talks and rumors of a DC making a Plastic Man movie. If it ever happens, it will likely depend on the future success of DCEU films at the box office. In the mid-2000s, comic book movies were slowly starting to take center stage. Marvel Studios was developing plans that would eventually blossom into the Marvel Cinematic Universe. The success of Spider-Man 2 at Sony proved comic book franchises could repeatedly make big money at the box office. DC had suffered failures like 2004's Catwoman, but then roared back in 2005 with Christopher Nolan's Batman Begins. A bounty of potential superhero films was being considered following the success of these few. One of them was Green Arrow the Robin Hood-like character who had a sizable following at the time. A script for Green Arrow was written by Batman Begins writer David S. Goyer and future Jungle Book writer Justin Marks. The project was announced in April 2007, titled Green Arrow Escape from Supermax. It was loosely based on the Batman graphic novel called Arkham Asylum, A Serious House on Serious Earth, a novel which also inspired the popular video game Batman Arkham Asylum. The plot was supposed to follow Oliver Queen as he fights crime. The character was envisioned as a cross between Jason Bourne and MacGyver, which lasts for about the first 10 minutes of the film. He is then framed for murdering a high-ranking government official from the organization Checkmate. The Checkmate organization was created to protect people both from heroes and villains alike. Nobody believed Queen's denials that he did not murder the government official, and he is thrown into the Supermax prison. Nobody can help him, even the love of his life, Dinah Drake aka Black Canary isn't available and doesn't appear in the film. Prison is the last place Queen wants to be. Not only is security tight, but it's populated by many B and C list DC villains from various comics. The long list of prisoners included Blockbuster, Gemini, Icicle, The Pied Piper, The Riddler, and Lex Luthor. Queen would befriend The Pied Piper and a small group of criminals while trying to escape. It was even hinted that the Joker was to be present somewhere in Supermax. The prison warden was to be Amanda Waller, who did not have a high opinion of Queen. Throughout Queen's journey to escape, the film would occasionally flash back to Queen's origin story when he was trapped on a desert island. The third act consisted of Queen breaking out of the Supermax prison and most of the low-level villains dying in the process. After escaping, there would be a series of revelations including an elderly CEO named Marcus Cross who convinced Queen's best friend Hackett to maroon him on the island. Queen failing to clear his name, and Queen being sent back to prison. In the end, Queen ultimately does clear his name and turns the tables on all his antagonists, including Waller. Possible actors for the role included Matt Damon as Oliver Queen. It appeared the project was doing well at first. It survived the shift DC took following the success of The Dark Knight, something which doomed several other projects including Justice League Mortal. In late 2008, another writer was being considered but there still was no confirmed release date. In 2009, when a horror movie called Supermax was in development, Goyer was asked if Green Lantern Escape from Supermax was going to be released. He was quoted as saying, Warner Brothers is moving very slowly in terms of what they're intending to do with their DC projects. They just recently brought on DC Entertainment President Diane Nelson, and once they figured that out, they're going to get back to us on that one. That was the last time Green Arrow Escape from Supermax was mentioned. 
The project clearly died sometime in the early 2010s before the release of films like Man of Steel. In 2015, Goyer commented that he thought the film was too far ahead of its time. DC had become nervous after the movie Iron Man and thought a film not centered on Batman or Superman would fail. Whether it would have bombed or made money is impossible to say, but the project's influence has not withered despite it never making it to the screen. The CW series Arrow has used quite a bit of material from the script over the years, including similar events, characters, and even the name Supermax. Despite being one of the most iconic superheroes, a movie version of Wonder Woman was slow in development at Warner Brothers. For most people of a certain age, actress Linda Carter became synonymous with the role in the mid-1970s. One of the reasons for the slow movement on a Wonder Woman movie was the studio's fear that a female-led superhero movie wouldn't sell to a mainstream audience. By the 1990s, the only real example of a female-led superhero film was 1984's Supergirl, starring Helen Slater, produced by Ilya and Alexander Salkine. Efforts began in earnest in 1996 when Ghostbusters director Ivan Reitman signed on to produce and possibly direct a Wonder Woman feature film. Three years later, Minority Report writer John Cohen joined the project alongside Predator producer Joel Silver, who envisioned Sandra Bullock as the actress to play Diana Prince. Little progress was made, and in 2001, Ant's co-writer Todd Alcott was hired to write with Joel Silver's company, Silver Pictures. In addition, Silver Pictures agreed to finance the project. The list of actresses then grew to include the likes of singer Mariah Carey, Catherine Zeta-Jones, and Xena Warrior Princess star Lucy Lawless. The Alcott script was heavily altered over the years by Smallville writer Philip Levins and Prince of Tides writer Becky Johnson. By 2003, future Terminator Genesis writer and Alita Battle Angels screenwriter Leila Caligridis was tapped to write a script. By March of 2003, after the Caligridis script failed to move forward, a new name was added to the project. Joss Whedon, known at the time for creating the television series Buffy the Vampire Slayer, was announced as the new director and writer of Wonder Woman. Although Whedon's script was more coherent, it too was never completed. Whedon's version of Wonder Woman was set in the modern world. It started with Steve Trevor, a former soldier who was delivering supplies for refugees of a war-torn nation, crashing on the island of Themyscira. He is sentenced to death but is saved by Princess Diana who engages in trial by combat with her mother for Trevor's life. Diana accompanies Trevor to the modern world in order to explore the vast nations of men. The rest of the movie then takes place in the magnetic city called Gateway, which is suffering from great inequality and poverty. Throughout the script, there are obvious critiques of groups, notably college students who are portrayed as trying to fix problems without first understanding them. Steve Trevor was the film's protagonist, not Diana. The film's main villain, Strife, is a male in this version instead of a female. Strife is the minion to a weapons manufacturer called Callus, who happens to own a robotic chimera which can annihilate an entire city. Strife is also the nephew of Ares, the god of war. At the end of the second act, Strife captures Trevor and convinces Diana to give up all her powers to save him. She agrees and is banished to South America. She returns to Gateway and defeats Strife after a long journey in the jungle, where she discovers she doesn't need her powers. The film's ending would have teased further sequels, with Ares being the main antagonist. Although Whedon was not in charge of casting, he secretly wanted either Angelina Jolie or Kate Beckinsale to play Wonder Woman. However, this was not to be. By 2007, Warner Brothers and Silver Pictures were deeply unimpressed with Whedon's script. Despite attempts to correct the issues, in February 2007, Whedon left the project. The day before Whedon departed, Warner and Silver purchased a spec script from two largely unknown writers. Matthew Jennison, who had worked primarily as an assistant on the film Beer Fest, and Brent Strickland, an actor known mostly for bit parts, including the 2004 Snoop Dogg film, Soul Plane. Their version of Wonder Woman was to be a historical period piece. Joel Silver admitted the new version was bought to prevent the loss of the film rights. However, they did like the change in the time period. Ten years later, and with plenty of screenwriters used in between, the project became the 2017 film Wonder Woman, directed by Patty Jenkins. Whedon's script by this time was ancient history, but his version was leaked shortly after the Jenkins film was released. Critics tore Whedon's version asunder for shoddy writing and sexist content. Whedon defended it to no avail. The draft serves as a small peek into how DC's leading heroine could have been portrayed if she had hit the screen 10 years earlier. Some wonder if it would have made female superheroes more popular, or would it have been a repeat of Supergirl's failure, setting female superhero movies back for years to come. In 1997, the comic world looked on in horror as Joel Schumacher's Batman and Robin killed the most popular DC Warner Brothers franchise. 
Warner Brothers had known cinematically Batman was done for some time and had canceled projects like Joel Schumacher's Batman Unchained. They also knew in the future Batman would be viable again, so they planned for the day the Cape Crusader could return to the silver screen and not be mocked for bat nipples and ice puns. Three years later, Warner thought the time had arrived and started looking for a director. Warner had been looking at Darren Aronofsky, a then up-and-coming director, and asked him how he would handle a Batman film. The self-proclaimed Batman fan answered that he would adapt Frank Miller's graphic novel The Dark Knight Returns, have it star Clint Eastwood, and that he would shoot it in Tokyo. Warner Brothers liked his answer, and it is believed to be the main reason he was hired. At the time, Aronofsky had previously only directed the 1998 film Pi. His second film, Requiem for a Dream, premiered just a few months after he was hired to direct the new Batman film. Once on the job, Aronofsky changed course from the proposed plot, saying he wanted to adapt the popular storyline Batman Year One. He believed that this plot would entirely restore Batman's reputation after years of late-night comedians mocking him. Frank Miller agreed to contribute to the screenplay with Aronofsky. This wasn't the first time they had worked together. Years earlier, they had previously attempted to bring Miller's comic Ronin to life. The script could be best described as an incredibly loose adaptation of the proposed Year One screenplay. The general characteristics of Batman for the most part were the same, however much else had been altered. In the script, after his parents are murdered, Bruce Wayne loses all his money and becomes homeless. He is taken in by Big Al, a black auto mechanic who runs a dingy repair shop. His son, Little Al, raises Bruce after Big Al dies. Bruce grows up fixing cars and watches Gotham slowly fall apart. Little Al's customers include corrupt police officers, pimps, and depressed prostitutes, including Selina Kyle. After watching a child on television nearly killed by both a crazed gunman and the Gotham Police Department, Bruce can't take it anymore. He becomes a vigilante to protect the good and punish the bad, equipped with a costumed cape, a Lincoln Continental with two bus engines, and a hockey mask. The name Batman comes from the mark on Bruce's ring, originally his father's, which he leaves on criminals after he attacks them. The press decided it resembled a bat. While fighting crime, Bruce writes letters to his dead father, sometimes feeling he has hallucinated actual conversations with him. The other half of the story centered on police officer Jim Gordon, dealing with unprecedented corruption in the police department and rising crime rates. He can barely take the stress, and the first scene with him shows him contemplating suicide. His boss, the highly corrupt Commissioner Loeb, demands Batman be brought down. Eventually, Gordon almost captures Batman in an abandoned building that the police bomb when they find out he's in it. Batman gets away and Gordon finds proof of Loeb's corruption, which he gives to assistant DA Harvey Dent. With Loeb out of the way, Gordon begins his ascension to police commissioner. At the very end, Bruce manages to claim his lost inheritance and moves into Wayne Manor, knowing he will make his parents proud. Joaquin Phoenix was the actor Aronofsky wanted most to play Batman, however the project never advanced into the casting stage. When Warner Brothers saw the script, they were horrified. An R-rated Batman film more inspired by 1970s crime dramas like Taxi Driver, Serpico, Death Wish, and The French Connection was a bridge too far for them to accept. The project was quickly shelved, and both Miller and Aronofsky went their separate ways. While never filmed, this version of Batman Year One did influence Batman's return to the big screen. Batman Begins was unabashedly inspired by the comic, and a few elements were pulled from Aronofsky's script. In 2011, an animated version of Batman Year One was released. This is likely to be the closest thing to a filmed version of the dark, gritty, and realistic Aronofsky take on Batman. Although DC may be making strides to distance itself from its spectacular failures, the legions of cancelled projects left in their wake will likely never be forgotten. The ghosts of Batman vs Superman and lost movies will always haunt Detective Comics. Unanswerable questions will continue to be raised. Would Guy Ritchie's Lobo have made the character popular to average moviegoers or damned him to obscurity? Would Plastic Man be as popular as Deadpool if he had done it first? Would Green Arrow, Escape from Supermax, be hailed as an action superhero classic? Would female-led superhero films be more common to the world if Joss Whedon's Wonder Woman managed to get off the ground? Would a gritty crime drama starring Batman have been a box office success? These are questions forever to be asked in think pieces and what-if scenarios, but will never truly be settled. What do you think? Would you have seen any of these cancelled DC movies? Could they have been hits? Let us know your thoughts in the comments.